Welcome back to the channel, you curd nerds. We've got an instrument mock check ride here for you. I know we've mostly been doing private pilot. I do a lot of mock check rides, but I only put up the ones that the students are okay with me putting up. And I also only put up the ones where the students do fairly well. I'm not going to have somebody embarrass themselves, even if they are okay with me recording it and putting it up online. If they did really badly, I'm not going to share it. I'm not going to put somebody out like that. So if you have been thinking about getting a mock check ride, don't worry about it ending up on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or anything like that. If you're concerned about how well you're going to do, but beyond that little disclaimer, we did a mock check ride for Kim engineers. She's on all the same social media that I'm on. And she was an absolute joy and hoot to talk to and do this mock check ride with. She did pretty well. There's a few little things we had to brush up on and fill a couple gaps here and there, but she did pretty well. If I'm going to be honest, not necessarily check ride ready, but just a little bit more studying and she'll be completely ready. Without further ado, let's get into the mock check ride. I hope y'all enjoy it. And as always, leave your comments down below for any kind of questions, any comments, concerns, or if I got something wrong, I am more than happy to be wrong if y'all got a correct answer for me. So let's get into the mock check ride. Before we go any further, I just always ask on every single one of these, you know, are you okay with me recording this and using it for content, etc.? Uh, whether it be TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, social media, in the in its entirety. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, Kim the Engineer is it Kim Engineers on uh, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok? Uh, yep, Kim Engineers. So you are getting ready to go take your instrument uh, check ride. What are you doing it in? A Cessna 172 G1000 equipped with the electronic standby. Even like this is really new. It's oh. Great. Wow, that is so. the The G one thousand is definitely the airplane to do an instrument rating in, especially because you don't have to worry about like crab angles and, and like crosswind corrections. And I mean, you just follow the purple line for a hold, don't you? Is it cheating? I mean, yeah. Uh, not not trying to sound like an elitist or snob or anything, but the an instrument rating in a G one thousand does not mean that you are ready to go fly swinging needles in a six pack. Um, uh, I on that yeah truth yeah. <laughs> there, there there is now, we do practice i mean yes it will draw the whole hole for you but we do practice switching the gps to um like suspend obs mode and stuff like that so you can set a course so you can have a needle and like fly a little waypoint stuff like that with holds so we try not to cheat when we can <laughs> but uh, yeah it's cheating <laughs> yeah it, it is believe me i have flown hard ifr down to minimums in my airplane and um uh, uh -huh. <laughs> If I was trying to do that fresh out of IFR in my G1000 days, um, I'd have gotten myself killed. Uh, but Truth. awesome. So uh, without further ado, uh, how many hours are you at? Oh, like total in life? Ah, I mean, you know, wh whatever you've logged, how much you've done in instrument, you know. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to crack this log book and look. Because um, I need to total this up and have a really great answer for this. And I'm like, real check lot, <laughs> right? Um, I've been, let's see, 193 total hours in my life in little airplanes, 143 flight training. So it's been mostly flight training. Um, 118 PIC, real instrument. I almost have four hours of actual, which is very exciting. That That is. Yeah. I thought I could turn over that, you know, get all the way to four, but you know, not quite. So, and I'm, I've been reassured. I need to go into another system and make sure that I've got the 35 required hours of training and the whole bit. And yeah, mm -hmm. I'll do that. Well, so here's the thing. Don't feel bad about not having all that instrument time. I was a CFI and I had 0.7 actual IFR. Oh my gosh. And the 0.7 hey. that I had was through a sandstorm. <laughs> oh, so you didn't even get the, well, all the clouds here in the winter, they are full of ice. And in the summer, they are full of thunderstorms. Yeah. So I don't know how often this is actually going to come into play, but uh, we'll see. You know, I, I, I love the fact that I had an IFR rating when I brought my airplane home because it was IFR for about seven hours of the nine hour flight. Um, <laughs> yeah. My, my buddy Mo uh, that came with me, he was bored out of his mind because he expected to like see things the <laughs> entire way. And he's like, 
It's clouds. I have no idea where I am. Yeah. Well, and I will admit, like, a, about an hour plus of my almost four hours was in a very gentle IFR situation where it was my long cross country. And we were, we happened to be flying through some puffy clouds that were right at like 5,000 feet. And so it's like, you fly through a cloud and then you're not. And then you fly through a cloud and then you're not. And so it would be like so ridiculously easy to escape from that. It's not like an intense, like, oh my gosh, we're down to minimums. We're in the soup situation. <laughs> but there's not like a difference there. So we had to have a real IFR clearance to be legal to do that. So we did. Exactly. So that, that, that counts, that counts. Well, um, like every check ride, or at least the check ride that you have been on, right? DPE is going to go over the three possible outcomes of every check ride, right? You've got satisfactory, unsatisfactory, and incomplete. Satisfactory means that you're consistently within the standards. Perfection is not the expectation. There is the expectation that there are going to be things you don't know and that you need to look them up. Uh, that's why I have the far aim app on my phone. It is like my aviation Google. All right. And, and Can I it, use that? Can I use that in a project? Why not? Okay. Cause this is so terrifies me. It's like, yes, I have this and I have cracked it open and I read it to go to sleep and the whole bit. But man, when I actually have a, a question, I Google it and then find the aim that way. Well, and that's the thing is like Google, they don't really like using Google, right? Because then you could end up on Cornell and then you could end up in an, in an outdated version of the far aim. But I if you've got that, not. yeah, <laughs> believe me, I know how to not do that too. But that DPE. <laughs> yeah, but yes, you're right. Um, and it's just, it's, it's about using um, the official sources. I like the idea of the app. It sounds like a step above the Google. Yeah, and that's the thing is like, you only get, get back, um, aviation related content, right? It's, it's, and it's 10 bucks. And I mean, the book that you've got right there is what 30 bucks every time you got to buy it. Yep. And it's a 2023. So I shouldn't even be taking this in. It could be completely changed in 2024. <laughs> exactly. You know, you know, that comma that they added, it's going to make you crash. <laughs> you know, exactly. <laughs> um, but I, I do love the app. I bought it, you know, what? almost a decade ago for 10 bucks. Yeah. And it's probably the only app that has stayed on my phone throughout those, the, those 10 years. I appreciate the recommendation. So next possible outcome of a check ride, right? There's unsatisfactory is what nobody ever wants to hear. Uh, the example I like to use for unsatisfactory on an instrument check ride or an instrument stage check is what I did on my instrument stage check. Uh, I lost situational awareness. Um, I didn't start descending until the missed approach point as opposed to the final approach fix. <laughs> Okay. And obviously uh, that's dangerous. Um, I don't know how the examiner kept a straight face the entire time. Cause I'm over there focused, staring at the instruments. Like I got this, I got this. And he's just over there in absolute silence, watching me screw this all up. <laughs> um, but with that in mind, remember the DPE is not really going to be providing any guidance, right? You've taken a check ride before. Um, then there's incomplete. Uh, this could be due to weather, uh, lack of, um, well, weather, airworthiness of the aircraft, safety of flight. Uh, the actual reg that covers it is like 6143 Bravo. Okay. So if you didn't want to look up all the appropriate reasons for a uh, incomplete, there it is. Now, what okay. documents is the DPE going to be asking for when you finally get to your check ride? Um, proof that I am eligible for a check ride. Um, for my flight school, and I've taken the ground test, the written ground test, so I'll bring that score. Um, my pilot's license, a photo ID, um, information about the airplane to make sure that the airplane's ready. Okay. Um, logbook is probably another really good option because they need to make sure, like, hey, have you actually met uh, the requirements? If your flight school has, like, a certificate that they give you saying, like, hey, look, this person's met the requirements based on these regulations, sometimes that works. But I've never met a DPE that's okay with just taking that certificate. They want to see the logbook, too. Um, oh, yeah, I, definitely. Okay. I can hop on Google and make one of those certificates. Yeah. Um, and then, <clears throat> all right. And the last thing DPE usually asks is, has you, have you read the ACS and do you understand the standards that you're being held to? I am reading the ACS. <laughs> all and right. I will not be covered by any standards. Yeah. Awesome. Right, awesome. Um, now, first big question, you know, when is an instrument rating required. Why do you need an instrument rating? When would you need one? If I want to fly in the clouds, because I don't have visual reference. Yeah. Um, so, and weather minimums uh, less than VFR. 
uh, class A base, so if I'm above 18,000 feet, and if I want to file an IFR flight plan for any reason. Awesome. Uh, one thing or two things that students usually uh, miss is the commercial uh, requirements. And here's the thing, you're not going in for commercial rating. So if they might I want not... to fly commercial at night, yes. That is so weird. Why would I get a commercial rating without having an instrument rating? It's skydivers. Okay. Yeah. If if you are already like a skydive pilot or if you are already like a skydiver and your boss is like, hey, I'll give you 40 grand to go get your pilot's license so that we can have another skydive pilot instead of shutting down shop because our pilot's leaving to the airlines. Mm -hmm. That would be a very reasonable reason to get uh, a uh, pro commercial rating without an instrument uh, rating. So one other thing, it's more than 50 miles as well. So carriage of passengers, oh, carriage of passengers more than 50 miles or at night. Okay. All right. Um, only other one that people usually forget special VFR between sunset and sunrise. Okay. All right. Um, but other than that, yeah, because I don't have a commercial rating, so in my head it doesn't apply. And um, the place where I rent airplanes does not allow special VFR, straight up. Just we don't do it. Yeah. Um, but you're right. I have to keep all that stuff in my head for all the stuff that doesn't apply for me. That's one of the tough things about this rating. Yeah, and it's it's not necessarily like the commercial one. That one's going to be good. That one's going to be fine. You're not going in for a commercial rating. You don't need to know your privileges and limitations as a commercial pilot because you're not going in for a mm -hmm. commercial rating. But that special VFR one does apply to you, even though your school doesn't allow it. I'm not giving mm -hmm. you an instrument rating or, you know, the DPE is not giving you an instrument rating saying that you can rent your school's airplane. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's, that's been a huge point of contention. In a lot of the big flight schools that all they do is train airline pilots like UND, Embry riddle, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The students like, when am I ever going to need that? I'm going straight to the airlines after I'm done here. Like what, what, what? like, well, Technically, that's not part of a limitation. I can't like put only for use in airline environment on your. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Awesome. Awesome. So um, you said you logged instrument time. So you know what the conditions are, which require which um, are required for you to actually be able to log it. So when can you actually log that instrument time? Um, well, you can log instrument time. It doesn't have to be real instrument. It could be simulated. So I've also logged every time I'm wearing foggles, that's 40 some hours of instrument time. Okay. And the only other thing is when you're solely by the reference of instruments under actual or simple simu simulated instrument uh, flight conditions. The reason I ask and bring it up is like, let's say you're crossing a body of water and it's <laughs> a little hazy. The haze could still be in excess of VFR minimums, but because you're over water, you don't really have any good reference. Yeah. Right. Have you ever actually crossed a body of water on a hazy or a smoky day? Yeah. It's impossible. You, okay. Yeah. You're, you're in IFR. All right. Um, okay. Now that's instructors. What about recency? So you got your instrument rating. Congratulations. Yay. Um, <laughs> I could dream. Uh, what do you need to do to maintain your currency? Uh, within the last six months, I have to confirm that I've had six instrument approaches, including holds, intercepts, tracking courses. Seems awesome. like there's something that's... What's up? Seems like there's something that starts with an S. Holds, instruments, tracking courses, intercepts. I said that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty fine. Um, uh, but through the use of navigational electronic uh, systems. I think that's what you're looking for. You're looking for the six hits acronym, uh, right? Six instrument yes. approaches, holding, intercepting, tracking uh, through the use of navigational electronic systems. I think like what it's trying to say is like, you can't do it via like old school approaches, like where they used to shine a light up through the clouds at the beginning of the runway. Okay. Yeah. Tracking a highway does not count. Yeah. Um, now, does all this have to be done in an airplane? Uh, no, you can use an approved simulator. Okay. So uh, I've got like the honeycomb yoke and throttle and all that stuff. Does that count? Like I can just hook no. that up to my computer? No. Not special enough. Okay. Um, so if you went to a flight school and they said, hey, we have 
a Redbird sim, but it hasn't been checked out by the FAA. Is that good? No. No, right? So an ATD, FTD, or full flight sim, like, right? Um, now, what about after that six months? Let's say, I don't know, you're like me and your airplane maintains its airworthiness certificate on a weekly basis, if that, uh, <laughs> and you go six months without flying. Uh, what do you need to do then? Uh, then I could, um, I could grab a friend and get my foggles and we could go do six approaches and then I'd be great. Awesome. Now, or uh, whatever it takes to get six approaches. Like, you know, if I did three my last month then three and then great. Awesome. Now what's the minimum rating for that, 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 well, the safety pilot or your friend. Uh, they just have to be a, a private pilot. Yes. They, they have to have. Uh, current medical and they have to be um able to they have to be in that airplane they have to be able to take the controls of that airplane yep, yep. uh to get their, their job is just to look out for traffic and while well, i'm wearing foggles pretty much awesome the only reason i ask is a lot of people say that they have to be appropriately rated for the category in class um there's nothing stopping you from getting your instrument currency in like let's say an rv12 which is in the, it's a uh, <laughs> Experimental aircraft, light sport aircraft, I think. Don't quote me on that. But what I'm getting at is a sport pilot can't be used as a safety pilot. Even though they're appropriately and rated for an R like an RV-12 or like a, a Cessna Skycatcher would be in a per perfect example, like a Cessna 162. They're appropriately mm -hmm. rated category in class to act as pilot in command of that aircraft. Mm -hmm. But sport pilots, I guess, aren't allowed to be safety pilots. Really? Yeah, it's kind of weird. Minimum rating is private pilot. Okay, I hadn't caught that. I'm glad we had this discussion. <laughs> right. Even if I'm flying in a in a skycatch, it's a light sport airplane that they're for it. Nope, private pilot. That's ridiculous. Okay, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. sorry, I don't want to criticize <laughs> any policies or things. And I'm just surprised. Yeah, yeah, we don't want to criticize anything the FAA does. Um. <laughs> Who am I? To, I'm sure there's a great. Reason. It's just that a light sport pilot has to be just as capable as everybody else is looking out for traffic, and that is their job. So that's just surprising. But that's okay. Okay, that's great. Now I know. Awesome. Now, um, after that, let's say you still don't do anything. I don't know. You you just stopped flying. You're like, you know what? I'm done flying for like a year, two years. What 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 would you need to do to be able to get back into into instrument conditions? Then I would have to hire a CF double I and do a proficiency check. Awesome. If it's been 12 months. Yep. Now let's say you come back to flying and you're like, I'm gonna go get my multi-engine rating and you go and get a multi-engine instrument rating. Does that count? Yes. Yes, it does. Right. So it's it, not. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. I was talking, but I really had nothing else to say. <laughs> And I have heard your other advice that like, don't, don't pass up an opportunity to stop talking. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so. that's a, that's a nicer way to put it. <laughs> uh, yes. Is an answer. So that's my answer. Done. Good. Yes. Yes. Right. Um, you know, what time, do you know what time it is? Yes. Yes. Uh, that's probably going to piss the DPE <laughs> off one day. They're going to be like, but cheese pilot said, like, who the hell is cheese pilot? Um, <laughs> <clears throat> my internet friend said that I could, yeah, <laughs> that'd go over great. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Now, um, you filed instrument flight plans. So you understand kind of the rules about filing an instrument flight plan. Um, when do I need an alternate? Um, you need an alternate if, okay, wait, it's the one, two, three roll within one hour of your, um, estimated time of arrival. The visibility is less than three miles or the ceiling is less than 2,000 feet. Awesome. Now, let's say I did file an alternate. What does that alternate need to have? Oh, my gosh. Um, it has to have a s instrument approach. And a it's coming to me in little spots, 600 foot ceiling if it has a precision approach or 800 foot, if it's a non-provision approach, I have this written down. I should just look at, well, I have a cheat sheet. Am I allowed to have a cheat sheet in the thing? Um, I usually recommend against cheat sheets because okay. uh, cheat sheets can be wrong. That's why I always say, go back to the, go back to the, the reference material, right? 
Um, I've okay. played this joke on a lot of students at UND. They'll have like a cheat sheet or a study guide that's gotten passed around between a bunch of different students and they expect to answer the questions in the same order every time. So uh -huh. I'll just throw in like a, how do you carry a cow from your wing kind of question? And they're like, uh -huh. what? <laughs> and it totally throws them off. Yeah. Okay. Um, so th that's why I, I, I try to steer away from like the cheat sheets, the study guides, um, and always going back to the source material at the end of the day. Right. Okay. Um, but what you're looking for is precision 602, non-precision 802. Uh, what if there's no instrument approach? Then it has to be VFR. Okay. Um, so it's not just VFR, right? Ceiling and visibility must allow a descent from MEA approach and landing under VFR conditions. So if my destination is, you know, overcast 5,000, eight mile mm -hmm. visibility, but my cruise altitude or my MEA is 6,000, I can't use that as my alternate, right? Because I yeah. can't get oh, yeah. down from MEA approach and landing under VFR conditions. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. Um, but your aircraft's equipped with gloss, right? Yes, it is. All right. So what's your considerations or what are you thinking about now that you've got WAS um, when it comes to filing an alternate? I mean, I can use WAS for all kinds of things. Okay. I don't know. I can use it for on route cruise. Stuff like that. I don't know. Okay. So it depends on if you're equipped with a non wash GPS flight plan can be based on GPS approach at either destination or alternate, but not both. So if you don't have WAS, right, you can't plan based on a GPS on both your destination and your alternate. If you want the reg or if you want the reference, you're looking at aim one dash one dash 17 B. Okay. All right. Um, well, since you do have WAS and you do have a barrel aiding altimeter, you can use LNAV VNAV as your destination and your alternate. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, but I'll be reviewing this very carefully because the, it, yeah, the idiosyncrasies of WAS and non-WAS and stuff like that, fascinating. Right. So we'll break it down a little bit more Barney style. So non-WAS, I can mm -hmm. only use GPS for my approach for either my destination or my alternate. Okay. Right. So let's say I'm going from, you know, India whiskey alpha to Tucson, right? Tucson has a, has a, an ILS. So I'm going to say, I'm going to Tucson. I'm going to use ILS. I'm going to use the ILS down in Tucson. My alternate mm -hmm. is Marana and Marana has an LNAV VNAV. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But let's say I'm going to, uh, what's another one? Uh, Coolidge would be a different airport and Coolidge only has GPS oh. approaches. That means I can't use Marana as my alternate because Marana only has GPS approaches. If I'm non was if you're non was since we, okay. Have it's almost like if so, you're going to have a random error that would prevent you from using a non was then it's going to happen everywhere. So they're like, you got to diversify, right? Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, pretty they much. Saying that if your system was to have some kind of failure, you were to have some kind of error, uh, you need mm -hmm. to make sure that you have at least a plan to get down. Yes. Okay. Right? Um, I don't know if you've ever been up in the clouds and not had a way to get down. It's terrifying. It happened yeah. once and I'd never want to do it again. <laughs> Did you just fly around? No, my, um, what you call it? My GP, my iPad dumped all of my charts because I didn't turn it on airplane mode. You know, bad cheese. I know because um, it found oh signal and tried to update and dumped all my old charts while it was updating. Uh huh. And I'm just flying around listening to Jimmy Buffett, having a good time. Uh huh. <laughs> and uh, then when I'm like, and then when I start diverting around a storm uh, again in my airplane, um. I'm like, hey, I don't have enough gas to get to my destination anymore. I'm going to have to divert. So I start looking for an approach to, to get down and get some gas. And mm -hmm. I realize I don't have any approach plates. So I, you know, I also I also got on the other side of the storm and lost contact with Kansas City Center as well. So it was, it was a whole disaster. Um, but 
they ended up vectoring me to a small patch of, of VFR. And the only reason they knew it was VFR is because there was a bunch of crop dusters out there with their transponders on. <laughs> okay. That's one way to, Oh my gosh. Yeah. So that's terrifying. airplane mode, airplane mode. Okay. Okay. Good cautionary tale. Yes. Yes. Now, you're filing your flight plan. You're buying gas. We're always trying to be cheap. You know, the cheapest thing in an, uh, you know, the cheapest part in an airplane, the owner. Um, so we're trying not to spend a whole lot of money on gas. <laughs> what do I need? Like, what is my bare minimum uh, when it comes to IFR? Are you asking what like equipment you need? No fuel. Oh, you have to have whatever it's going to take for you to get to your destination. And then get to your alternate in case you have to do the alternate, and then an extra forty-five minutes. All right, awesome. But now that you're bringing up um, equipment, what do I actually need in an airplane for it to be, you know, allowed to fly in IFR conditions? What kind of equipment do I need? You need everything you need for VFR. So airspeed and altimeter and oil pressure and temperature and all that stuff. Yeah, I don't know. Let's hand wave at it a little bit. Um, mm. And then, but you also have to have you have to have a, a barrel corrected altimeter so you have to have a colesman window that you can adjust mm -hmm. um you have to have a slip skid indicator you don't need that for vfr but a turn and bank indicator um a heading indicator that is like gyro heading it can't just be you know you need a step above a magnetic compass okay and um. uh those are the uh, first six things that came to my head all right. So we're missing just two. We need some kind of way to generate electricity, right? So we need to yep. generator or alternator, right? Uh, radios, two-way navigation, yep. uh, two-way radio equipment and navigational equipment suitable for the route to be flown. And clock. Yes. Now, does that clock count? Does this clock count? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it does. So no clock, clock needs to show hours, minutes, seconds, and needs to be part of the aircraft. Wow. Well, then why do I have to have this thing? Just uh, back it's up. Nice? Okay, fine. Well, great. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Now I know I have a clock. Um, it, but the thing is, is it's got to have a sweep second hand, right? So, uh, if, or it's got to have sweep or it's got to have some way to show seconds. So like, uh, like I think, uh, some of the dumpy Casio watches don't show seconds. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. Sure. Um, you know, I know you got a smartwatch, so you could end up with some screens that don't show seconds. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, now, the weirdest thing I've seen is that installed as part of the aircraft is pretty is pretty loose because I have seen people straight up Velcro stopwatches uh, to the dash. <laughs> and that counts in that aircraft for some god awful reason. I don't like it. Um, but yes, you do need a clock that's actually part of the uh, aircraft. So from the top, I like to use the mnemonic grab card, right? So we got generator, alternator, radio, radios, including, you know, navigational equipment suitable for the route to be flown, uh, a sensitive mm -hmm. altimeter adjustable for barometric pressure ball or slip and skid indicators, what you called it, right? Mm -hmm. Clock that shows hours, minutes, seconds with a sweep second pointer or digital representation installed as part of the aircraft equipment, uh, mm -hmm. attitude indicator, rate of turn indicator and directional gyro. Heading indicator. Okay. Right. Um, I love how you brought up the fact that the compass doesn't count. Have you ever tried to do compass turns in IFR? Uh, we practice doing like turn. Yeah. With the whiskey compass. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty bad. Yes, it is. It is. It does a lot of ridiculous things and you have to remember when to undershoot North and overshoot South and the whole bit and it's catching up and yeah. Okay. Well, what are those? Uh, what are those errors? What am I worried uh, about? Oh, yeah. Well, it's got a magnetic dip error. And so um, if you are turning to the north, you want to undershoot by about 30 degrees, like stop turning when it says you're 30 degrees from north and vice versa on the south. If go past the south and keep turning in the northern hemisphere. Yes, in the in the in the northern hemisphere. Um, I'm trying to remember if that's what ma magnetic dip is. I always remembered magnetic dip as if you start getting close to the poles, the magnet actually starts to dip down and then you can't see it. Oh, that's true. It gets wildly inaccurate in northern Canada. Yes. I, yes. What was that? I've heard. I have no plans to fly to northern Canada. 
No, no, <laughs> no. Um, and I don't even think that if you read through the supplement for your POA or for your G1000, there's actually uh, northern and southern limits for the magnetometer that's in it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you might not even be allowed to fly to northern Canada with the G1000. But let's get into, you know, you have all glass instrumentation. You have no six pack instrumentation. You have no steam gauges, no old school gyros. So let's get into specifically what other systems do you have? Like what system handles you, what would normally be your gyroscopic instruments? Uh, we have an AHARS. So okay. we're getting that. Yeah. You've got your AHARS. Um, so what are we actually going to lose if I lose my AHARS? Cause you can lose those systems independently of, uh, in the G 1000, the students hated me cause I just pulled a circuit breaker for it. Oh yeah. Uh, then you would lose your attitude and you would just, and your big, nice PFD would just be a big, nice red X. So am I going to lose everything on my PFD? Uh, your airspeed is from airspeed computer. Okay. Um, so I'm going to lose my attitude, my heading, my ball indicator, uh, my rate of turn indicator, yes. all of those things that I absolutely love. Now, what's going to happen to your HSI? Is your HSI going to die or are you still going to be able to get uh, some kind of deviation on course? The magnetometer feeds the AHARS. So I'm going to say your HSI is going to die. Okay. Um, now how do I maintain a course if I lose my AHARS? Am I just screwed and i need to go get a uh, pra a par approach i mean you still got gps so you can maintain your course like that okay so i do still have um a needle that i can follow awesome uh now let's get into some pedo uh, some pedo tube blockages what's going to happen if i end up with a static port blockage what's going to happen to my airspeed indicator with a blocked static port uh let's see here so as you're climbing your block static port, so as you're climbing, your altitude is just going to stay where it's at. Okay. And your airspeed will act like a reverse altimeter because there's fewer air molecules. So even if you're going at the same speed, it'll think that you are not going as fast and it'll slow down as you go higher. Yep. Yep. That's, that's, that's a pretty okay. solid, way to, solid way to put it. What could you do to fix this? Uh, we have an alternate static source thing that we check every time. Awesome. Yeah, so you can pull. Um, is there anything you need to do you need to be aware of when you pull that alternate static? Uh, I've, you know, I've never actually pulled the alternate static, so I haven't tested this, but um, they say that the cabin altitude is slightly higher than your regular altitude. Where do I have that reversed? I think you've got it reversed. It's going to be slightly lower. 50% chance of getting it right. Yeah, 50-50 shot. I'll just say different. Yeah, it's going to okay. be different. So, yeah, your cap might be a little bit lower. Awesome, awesome. Uh, now, even though you do have real fancy altimeter, right, you've got that real fancy G1000, um, if I'm just cruising around and I'm being lazy, I'm not setting my – I'm not paying attention to what ATC is telling me when they're telling me new altimeter settings. Um, what's going to happen if I just continue cruising on, if I'm going from somewhere like, let's say I'm flying from Arizona up to Colorado or North Dakota, and I'm just being a lazy turd, not resetting my altimeter at all. Am I going to be higher or lower than my indicated altitude? Oh, well, it depends on what your what the pressure is doing outside. Okay. Got, so if you fly to a place with lower pressure, then you will be lower than you think you are. Okay. So from high to low, watch out below. Um, yes. Same error applies when you start getting into temperature as well. That's why I was going from Arizona to North Dakota. So if we go from somewhere mm -hmm. of high, oh, sorry, that's got nothing to do with your altimeter. Um, I mixed, I combined two questions. <laughs> Yeah, but but it does. No, you, you're good. You're yeah. using altimeter, right? So yep. if high temperature is still high to low, look down below. Yep. Um, have you ever seen that little snowflake on an approach plate? No. No? Okay, so we'll go over that little snowflake when we start looking at approach plates. Um, okay. Does never... it mean that you have to care about when it's cold? Yes. So when you go to set up an approach on your G1000, it asks you for a temperature, doesn't it? Uh, it can, there's a, there's a, you can say if you want a barrel VNAV compensation in there. Okay. Um, and you normally are just like, why would I need that? 
I've never messed with it. Right. Never messed with it. Right. Um, let's see if I can find an approach for it real quick. Just, just since we brought it up, let's go find okay. I'll go to sky vector and, uh, look up an approach for it. I think there's one in North Dakota. I was about to say, this doesn't sound like something I would experience in Kansas, but you're from the North. So, um, no, Kansas definitely not going to experience this. Uh, that's Grand Forks. Um, GPS. This might be a Jep chart symbology that I'm thinking of, um, but I can see where it's talking about it on these ones. Um, okay. Yeah, let me know if I should look up an approach because yeah. Is, so uh, yeah. what I'm thinking of, if we go to uh, the RNAV GPS runway 09 at JFK or GFK, KGFK. So Gulf Foxtrot Kilo. We're going to Grand Forks. Okay. Yes. What approach did you say again? Um, oh, my screen's not doing what it should. Where'd it go? I'm um, talking about the barrow aided altimeter. Let me grab my screen real quick. There it is. Um, your chart might, are you using JEP or government charts? Government charts. Okay. So what I'm referring to is Barrow VNAV, uh, VDP not allowed when using Crookstone altimeter setting for uncompensated Barrow VNAV system. LNAV VNAV is not authorized below 16 degrees or above 54 degrees Celsius. When local altimeter setting is not received, use Crookston altimeter setting and increase your DA by 62 and your MDA by 80. Um, there's just one other one that I am looking for. Um, or did they get rid of them? GPS remote one eight. Let me see if I can track this one down. Um, there's the little snowflake. You seeing what I'm seeing? Or is my, am I correct? Yeah. All right. I mean, it's very funny on the little phone screen, but uh, there is a little, there is a little one. So you're in Aspen. Yep. So this is the GPS Foxtrot into Aspen. So A S E. I just Googled it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. GPS box rot. And there it is. It does have a little snowflake on mine. Snowflake, minus twenty two Celsius. Uh, GPS. I'm not leaving the house if it's minus twenty two <laughs> Celsius. Man, come on. <laughs> Nobody's leaving the house if it's minus twenty two Celsius. I but um let me see. So it says minus 22. So that's what you're going to, or I believe that's what you would set your, uh, that little barrow aiding to. All right. And do you know when these are, why these things happened? Why these little snowflakes came up, became a thing? Well, I'm guessing that it was very cold out and some airplane thought they were, you know, 500 feet above the ground and they were not. Yes. Yeah, so there was a guy, he actually clipped his landing gear on some trees on an approach and the FAA tried to hang him for it. And his insurance was like refusing to cover the claim and everything. So they were like, you, you drop below minimums intentionally. You were trying to scud run. And he's like, no, like I was like, I was on path. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Um, mm -hmm. And that's when these things started happening. So they did, they did an analysis of it in, in VFR, but at really cold conditions. And they were like, oh shit, actually, uh, that guy, that guy wasn't full of it. That guy wasn't full of nonsense. Um, so, 
I just like to bring that up because, you know, a lot of people forget about it. And I know I was asked about it on my instrument uh, check ride, but my instrument check ride was also like nine hours at Oral. So um, I, I've heard that that horror story. I yeah. Mean, gosh. Yeah. I, I want I want nothing to do with that guy ever again. Uh, <laughs> so continuing on, let's talk about some of these uh, navigational aids that you'll end up uh, uh, using. Let's talk about VORs. I know VORs aren't really used that often. Um, and we're getting down to what's known as MON. Or what is MON? What does that stand for when it comes to VORs? The acronym is M-O-N. I've seen it. I've never been curious what that meant. It's I just know what, what VOR stands for. Okay. so <laughs> It's a very high frequency omni range signal or something like that yeah. but yeah uh, okay m-o-n yeah m-o-n uh, is a minimum operational network the program ensures that uh as old vors are decommissioned a mon airport or minimum operational airport uh, is equipped with a legacy ils or vor approach is available within 100 nautical miles regardless of aircraft position as long as it's within the united states so what it's saying is if you are ever in a situation in which you never have gps you're always uh -huh. within 100 miles of somewhere where you can use vors to get to an airport Okay. Yeah. Thank so, goodness. <laughs> um, now, it is doing things to the service volumes. Um, what is the service volume when it comes to VORs, DMEs, ILS? What does a service volume mean? Um, it has to do with the range that the signal works. This is one of those things that I should re review a little bit more. Yeah. And I mean, it's in the aim. Um it, yes. A lot of this stuff comes directly from those back few chapters of the aim where it's really just talking about nav aids. Okay. Um, am I, can I get signal outside of a, of a um, service volume? Possibly. All right. Now, what am I concerned about if I'm outside the service volume, though? Um, accuracy of the signal. Accuracy. Is it, is it a real signal? Is it reflecting off of something or? Yeah. All right. Um, now let's talk about an ILS. Okay. Let's say ATC for some reason leaves you way high and drops you down on top of an ILS. Mm -hmm. What is, what are your concerns if you are descending at, let's say 1200 feet per minute to try and catch a glide slope? Oh my gosh. Well, I would have many concerns about just comfort, happiness. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but a glide slope can have extra side lobes in the area. You can get false indications that says you're on it when you're not quite there yet. If you're so far off. Okay. Um, what is, how would you know if you're on a false glide slope? I guess I would be much higher than the approach plate indicates that I should be for being on a glide slope. That you could end up being much higher than what the approach uh, plate would indicate. A lot of times they reverse they'll have reverse sensing to them uh, mm -hmm. when you're on okay. the, uh, when you're on the false glide slope, because what ends up happening is the 150 Hertz on the bottom reflects off of the ground upwards. Yes. So they'll reverse okay. sense a little bit. Uh, they'll also be extremely steep. You'll probably maintain that 1200, 1500 foot per minute descent just to try and stay on a false glide slope. So if you're like diving at the ground at full flaps going, mm -hmm. I'm about to overspeed my flaps, um, mm -hmm. false glide slope. Okay. Has this happened to you? No, no, thank I've been, God. I've never heard like tales of people being on a false glide slope. It almost seems theoretical, but I'm just curious. Uh, I've, it's never happened to me. Um, at least not in IFR conditions. Like I'll have like an ILS tuned in just uh, every time I go to do an approach and I know there's an ILS on the runway, I tune in the frequency just so I can see like, cause I'm always looking for them. One, I'm making sure that mine still works. Cause the last thing <laughs> I want to do is go try and use it and it doesn't work. Right. <laughs> Um, and you know, knowing my airplane for the love of God, uh, what's going to break this week. <laughs> um, but speaking about ILS is what are the three big components of an ILS? Yeah. Your localizer, which, uh, is at the end of the runway, a bunch of antennas keeps you on straight and love straight course and your glide slope which keeps you from in the right vertical. And then, uh, let's say lights. Okay. So 
a lot of people go directly for that because it, it's so just, or marker beacons. All right. And that's where the problem is, is because you end up going localizer, glide slope, marker beacons. Oh, but I can use GPS. But what about the lights? What about the visual? Right. And you're like, uh -huh. oh, wait, what? That, see, the actual three big components is guidance, which mm -hmm. is your localizer and your glide slope. You have oh, your man. distance, which is okay. going to be marker beacons, GPS, DME, cross radials, etc. And then uh -huh. you have your visual component. Got it. That's that's a whole other way to think about it. Great. Uh, yeah. um, awesome. Now. I'm going on down to my minimums, right? When can I drop below them? If you know that there is a runway in front of you. So you see part of the lighting system and the lights are guiding you in, there's going to be a runway. You've got enough of it identified that you can drop below and you can land. Okay. Now what if I just see the blinky little bl blinky white lights? What can I do? Oh, the, the strobe lights, the rabbits, strobe lights, the ones that kind of blink in sequential order. Yeah. Oh yeah. The rabbit. Okay. The real, um, you can, you can keep following it and descend. Well, I mean, you have to judge to yourself whether the, uh, visual range is within the category, within what the chart requires. Okay. Cause sometimes they'll say like, you have to be able to see 200 feet or something like that. Right now, let's say I'm doing like a VOR and I drop down to minimums. I, I dive mm -hmm. and drive like a terrible pilot, like sky. I'm not going to call them out directly. Uh, <laughs> Let's say I, I dive and drive down uh, to my minimums mm -hmm. and I'm still pretty far out. Right. And I start seeing the rabbits. What what can I descend down to now? A hundred feet above touchdown zone elevation. OK. Right. So um, I'll read it directly as it's written from 91 or kind of how it's written from 91, 175. I paraphrase it a little bit. Right. Um, the aircraft must be in a continuous position to land with the descent to landing on the intended runway can be made in a normal uh, descent rate using normal maneuvers. Right. Obviously, you can't cut the power, mm -hmm. pull the spoilers, drop the gear, slip it in. Right. Obviously, mm -hmm. that doesn't count. Uh, flight visibility. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can't Bob Hoover it down to the runway. OK. <laughs> All right. Uh, flight visibility. As you brought up, you need the appropriate visibility that's required for this approach. Mm -hmm. um, at least one of the visual references for the intended runway, right, is distinctly mm -hmm. visible to the pilot, except when doing cat two or cat three approaches, you're not getting qualified for cat two or cat three approaches. Okay. Um, okay. The approach light system, except the pilot may not descend below a hundred feet above touchdown zone elevation using the approach lights in reference, unless the red terminating bars and, and side row bars are also distinctly visible. So if all I've got is the rabbits, I can go down to a hundred feet above touchdown zone elevation. It's almost like taking another little peak. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but then if I start to see threshold markings, threshold lights, runway end identifier lights, visual glide slope, et cetera, then I can continue on. Okay. Okay. Um, red lights. As long as I start getting like red lights in sight, but if all I got is rabbits, I can go down to a hundred feet above. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Now let's get into RNAV. What does RNAV mean to you? Area navigation. Okay. What type of RNAV do you have in your airplane? GPS. Awesome. Do you know of any other types of RNAV? No. No, I just use GPS. Awesome. Right. Um, there are, but you are aware that there are other types of RNAV that RNAV and GPS are not interchangeable terms. Uh, I have heard that the term RNAV uh, predates the term GPS. So RNAV is like an umbrella in mm -hmm. which GPS slots under. Okay. OK, so there's a couple like little buddies hanging out underneath the umbrella of RNAV. Um, yeah. Oh, well, uh, Loram? Uh, Loram doesn't exist anymore, but that was a version of RNAV. Yes. OK, cool. Well, I mean, but OK, Are, is everything else under the umbrella weird old military stuff? No, you, you VOR DME, right? So you're I'll use okay. the CRJ 200, for example, this because the CRJ 200 is old. Um, it should have retired over a decade ago. It's tired. Please let that bird die. But 
VORDME uh, is what the, well, it's the secondary for what the GPS u- or for what the CRJ 200 uses. The CRJ 200 uses DME DME initially where its first nav source is six DMEs. That's what it's looking for. Mm-hmm. And it's going to navigate based on the six DMEs that it finds. It's going to use GPS as a backup. That's a lot of DMEs. Yes. Okay. But that is another thing that slots under RNAV. So when you get an RNAV approach, you can use GPS for that RNAV approach. But if you get a GPS approach, you're not using like DME, DME to do a GPS approach. Ah, gotcha. Does that make sense? I don't even have DME in my airplane. Yeah, the G1000 doesn't do DME and you don't have to worry about slant range either. Yeah, we just have fake DME with GPS and it's great. We move on with our lives. (laughs) Oh, I've had to use it before, and I I, I don't like it. I'm just like, wait oh, a minute. Oh, real DME with slant range stuff, and yeah. Yeah, I'm over here like, well, how high am I? I'm at 5,000, add yeah. a mile, carry the one. Hold this sheet of paper. Give me a... Give me a... <laughs> All right. Um, so there's other types, right? We've got Global Navigation Satellite System, or GPS is what you know it as. VOR, DME, VO, DME, DME, IRUs, and IRSs. Okay, or inertial reference units and inertial reference systems. Yep, there's that's a fancy system. Not yeah. going to have that. No. Okay. No. No. Um, awesome. Now it works in northern Canada, though. Yes, it does. That's how they used to navigate from, uh, like, across the oceans, and it's terrifying to think of that because they uh-huh. because the airplane is just like okay, I accelerated at such and such feet per minute for such and such amount of seconds, so I must be at this speed. And then I kept that. I had no level of acceleration this entire like two hours. So I must be here. I I know it's like that old meme where it's like the missile knows where it is because it knows where it isn't. Yeah. 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 And the, yeah, the inertia is like really like was just using inertia. It's like a fancy dead reckoning system, but I mean, it's good, but it's, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've heard from some military pilots that still use it that it's garbage. Uh, At least in at least in in helicopters, it doesn't work very well because the helicopter is just shaking like a dog. Well, it's vibrating and moving all over the place and bumping all around. Um, You know, there's a I I know some old guy that he used to be a first officer on the seven four for uh, some major carrier. I forget. He's that old. Like he was old enough to retire from being an airline pilot and then go get a master's in physics. Uh, awesome uh, and he used an IRU system I'm like that sounds terrifying um, to just be crossing oceans based on inertia and hoping you pick up a <laughs> VOR from Hawaii in time before you run out of yeah. gas I just feel like it's been a lot of miles yeah I, I just I just feel like we've we've we should definitely be picking up this VOR by now um mm-hmm. He fat fingered it one time and ended up 60 miles off course and they didn't notice it until they didn't pick up the signal from Hawaii. Wow. The good old day, man. Yeah, we're pilots for pilots. Exactly. Like last time I checked, back in my day, we used to land in the water and pull out a sextant at night to make sure we were on track. So let me measure some stars. Yeah, yep. look at this book. Yeah, that yeah. sounds awesome. Uh, apparently, UND has a class on um, celestial navigation. No, and and my wife. That would be awesome. Did my, you take it? Yeah, she took it, and that's the thing. I was trying to do some something in Microsoft Flight Sim where I was like going to pretend to like be an old school pilot in like a Boeing three fourteen in Microsoft Flight Sim, and I was like, "Come teach me how to do celestial navigation." I don't understand it. And she's like, uh, no, I, I took it for one class and immediately brain dumped it. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, I, it was a weird, it was a weird semester where I needed another credit to stay full time or else I was going to lose my like meal pass or something. I forget exactly that context. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it's like, it's like a speaking assembly language. Like you, you immediately, you are, you forget it the week after and you never look back. No, to be honest, I'm even not if even, it was interesting in the time, uh, to be honest, I'm not even sure what you mean by assembly language. Oh yeah. Like programming, like, you know, instead of Python or C, let's just get right there and index every little register on that memory bit when you're learning how to code. It's ridiculous. Oh, that, great. That, that sounds, that sounds miserable. 
it, it messes with your mind and then you can't program in any other language while you're taking it and then you immediately escape. Yeah, but it's like the good old days of programming. It's like Latin of programming. It oh. is dead. We don't need it anymore, but people who like to torture themselves uh, get all into it. And then you can program like this little tiny chip to do whatever the heck you want because you know how every little memory flag is doing all the time. Yeah. Oh. Uh, you guys aren't. You guys didn't learn how to program with like ferrite cores, like knitting ferrite cores. How they programmed. The <laughs> Great idea. No, I never did punch cards either. We hear, but we hear stories. Yeah. Those, that's really. That's really. So see, we're not old. Yeah, we're, we're not. Very. Yeah. Like, could you just imagine like knitting needles and ferrite cores? <laughs> that's like, that's awesome. It's like, look, there's a flash game. <laughs> yes. Awesome. <laughs> All right, well, let's let's talk about GPS for a second. Um, okay. Just give me like a like a good rundown on how GPS functions. Oh, GPS is great. So there are satellites, and they actually are kind of like stars, except that they tell you where you're there at, so you don't have to calculate all the angles and distances and stuff like that yourself. Um, there are ground stations now, as part of the WASP system in the U.S. anyway that um, help with any little error correction that they need to do. So you don't have to have as many satellites. Uh, before WASP, we had to do rain calculations to make sure that there would be enough satellites at your destination. But, because um, you need four, you know, lat long, it's like these 3D bubbles of like triangulation that are telling you where you're at. And uh, I don't know, how's that for GPS? Uh, it's, it, it's not bad. Um, you know, what I, what I, I hate to say, you know, kind of give them a script. Um, What I like to say is GPS is almost like DME where, but instead of the, the satellite requiring an interrogation signal from the airplane, GPS is sending out a signal with a timestamp. My what? airplane receives that signal and goes, Hmm, that's when the signal left. This is what time it is now. And based on the you know theory of relativity and the speed of light and all that other jazz, I must be this far away. Right. And then, yeah. um, we start getting to how many satellites are actually required. So how many satellites um, do you need to just have kind of like a 2D position in space? Well, uh, that three. Okay. Um, now, if I had five satellites, what does that give me? A better position. Okay. Your altitude. Go ahead. Uh, and altitude. Okay. So... so a 3D position in space because you said 2D on the first one. So, yeah, we're right. 3D. So, well, that's why I jumped straight to five. Four is a 3D, lat long altitude. Uh, five, mm -hmm. that's going to give us rain. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. Five's going to give the us extra, extra correction. Got it. Yep. Um, now, you brought up WAS. What is WAS? You said it's something about ground stations. What does WAS stand for? Just so we can kind of get that out of the way. Wide area augmentation system. Okay. Um, and it improves what? your accuracy it can measure whether any of those satellites are off a little bit it knows where it knows exactly where it's at and so it's always reading those satellites and so it's like okay well if this one's telling me i'm actually over here we know it's not right because i know where i'm at so we can nudge you over there awesome awesome now now that i've got was i can do some special approaches right what are those new approaches that i can do and if i didn't have was i can do these new approaches uh you can do lpv approaches need was Mm hmm And Elnav Vnav. Okay, one more. Localizer performance uh, approaches. LP approaches. Okay. Right? Okay, yeah. Because what's the difference between a GPS needle and a VOR needle other than color? <laughs> yes, one is green. Yes, one is green. Um... um well, I mean, when you're on approach, you have a much more accurate. Those VOR needles have, what, 10 degrees on either side? Okay. So it's an angular indication? Yes. All right. But a GPS is uh, what? It's a lateral oh, indication. Lateral. Right? Yeah. What changes when you start doing LPV approaches to that GPS needle? It now becomes a cone, right? Okay, so then it becomes an angular yes. 
wow, I've never thought about this, but you're completely right. As you, it just, it's just like an ILS. As you get closer, you have to make tiny little corrections. Yep. Great. Yep. Um, now, I've, I've been struggling to find on whether or not the VNAV portion of it is the same way, like the vertical mm-hmm. guidance of it. Um, I can't find any book that says one way or the other, or maybe I'm just not looking hard enough. Um, but what I do know is the lateral portion does become more and more sensitive the closer you get. Okay. All right. <clears throat> now, I like to bring up GBAS just in case uh, the, D, the DPE likes to talk about or wants to talk about it. You aren't equipped to do GBAS approaches or ground-based augmentation system. Uh, used to be known as loss or local area augmentation system. Have you ever heard that term? Yes, I've heard it. Yeah. Okay. Loss is the old version or is the old uh, name for it. They were trying to keep the same kind of naming ideology from WASP. And they were like, oh, we'll call it loss. And people were like, oh, that sounds too much like lost. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> so they changed it to GBAS. I only know of one GBAS approach and it's in California. My wife did it like a month ago. Um, and she said it's an ILS. (laughs) It it works just like an ILS. She was like critically thinking about all the technology differences that are driving the same needle that she just gets going to stay on all the time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, No, no. She didn't, she didn't do anything. She programmed FMS and noticed it said GBAS next to it. She's like, Oh, enter. (laughs) That was, that was the whole thought about it. Um, awesome. Awesome. We talked about RNAV. We talked about, um, now what, I'm just curious, what methodology of attitude instrument flying were you kind of taught, right? So we, we, we've got control performance and primary supporting, or have you not been taught that there's even a difference? I heard those terms in another video. That was the first time I'd heard those terms. Okay. Um, I'm fine with that. Then we won't dig into it because I don't want to mess up your training. (laughs) Okay. Um, I'll look up more though. Is this a common thing? So that's the way. Like, so am I supposed to pick a side? Uh, (laughs) Yes, yes. Uh, The the right side is primary supporting. The the no, I'm kidding. Uh, (laughs) The shills use control performance. Um, No, what what I've seen a lot of people doing is they're kind of melding them together at this point um, because it works. The only reason I I teach primary supporting method and what primary supporting method is, is it's saying that these are the instruments that are going to provide you data for pitch, bank and power. Mm -hmm. None of them, none of the primary ones are going to be your attitude indicator. Your, it pretty much pulls all reliance off of the attitude indicator. And the reason it was kind of taught that way is because the attitude indicator is a double, double gimbaled gyro. It's got pendulous veins. It's got all kinds of nonsense going on inside of it. So it, it, if something's going to fail, it's going to be that one, right? It's got a lot of points of failure. So they taught the primary supporting method saying, Hey, um, pitch your primary instrument to indicate whether or not you need more or less pitch is going to be your altimeter. Cause it's going to be the first thing to respond if your pitch is wrong. Okay. All right. Your backup is going to be like your VSI or your supporting instrument is going to be your VSI. So if you see your altimeter, all of a sudden peg starts rolling away, but your VSI, your supporting instrument is showing mm-hmm. zero, then your altimeter is broken. So it provides you, the ability to cross-reference other instruments or it gives you a framework to cross-reference other instruments to make sure that you're not working on erroneous data and it also pulls the reliance off of the attitude indicator. Because for control performance says, pitch for six degrees up, set 2,500 RPM, that's an 80 knot climb. Oh, but that's kind of, that kind of is what I was taught. And it works in a Cessna. I mean, you have to keep up all your scans and everything like that, you know. But, yeah, um, if you're tired of drifting off your altitude, make sure you pick up pitch and stick with it. Mm -hmm. And it works great. The only reason I I like the primary supporting method more is because when I say that you're ready to go be an instrument pilot, you're ready to go be an instrument pilot. You're not ready to go be an instrument pilot in a G1000 and a Cessna 172. Mm -hmm. So if all I ever taught you was control performance, you're going to go hop Mm -hmm. in a Mooney or a Cirrus or what have you. And aim uh-huh. for five degrees nose up and 2,500 RPM. And you're going to rip the flaps off of the damn thing. Cause you've got way too much power now. And that's not enough nose up to actually m- maintain an appropriate airspeed. Ah, uh, okay. 
Yeah. So when you get into a new airplane, your first question should not be, what's my RPM for 90 knots? Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. It allows you to pretty much transition between aircraft to aircraft. And now that I'm teaching in the, the, the Airbus, I'm starting to mm -hmm. see a lot of the people that are focusing primarily on control performance because they start asking, okay, what, what pitch do I maintain on climb out? Yes. And I'm like, no, just, just pitch. <clears throat> this is your vertical speed that you are trying to get to on climb out. Yes. Yeah. Or, you know, it's really just follow the flight director. Uh, <laughs> um, Great. But, you know, when I start teaching like the type rating, I have to kill their flight director. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm not saying continue on in your training trying to learn a new method of, of instrument control. Yours works and it's adequate for your check ride. What I'm saying is, uh, here, I'll show you a control performance card. I don't know if you've, or not a control performance card, but a uh, primary supporting chart. Oh, come on. Not that one. There it is. There we go. Oh, that's way over there. So as you can see right here on this card, straight and level mm -hmm. flight, my primary power indication is my airspeed indicator. And I know mm -hmm. in, a, in a Cessna, that's kind of like a joke because um, <laughs> you don't have enough power to really like make a lot of impactful changes to your airspeed. Um, <clears throat> but your altimeter is your primary pitch indication. Your heading indicator is your primary bank indicator. Cause those are all going to be the first things to change. If you need to make adjustments to those, okay. to, to those, right? So if my airspeed's not fast enough, I'm going to add power. Okay. Um, now it's also relying on the fact that you're a pilot and you understand that when you add power, you're most likely going to need to pitch down slightly or add a little bit of nose down trim, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but as you can see, it's not specific to the aircraft. The control performance um, scenarios are always specific to the aircraft and kind of specific to your area as well. Because if you're flying in Kansas, it's hot and six degrees nose up and full power could very well be an 80 knot climb for you. But the moment you take that to North Carolina or not North Carolina, but North Dakota or upper Canada where the air is thick and dense, it's almost like syrup in comparison to Kansas air. Um <laughs> that five degrees nose up or six degrees nose up at 2,500 RPM could give you 90 knots as opposed to 80. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Now build cool. yourself a control performance card for every airplane you get into. Cause it gives you kind of a, a somewhere to aim for. Yeah. Okay. That's good advice. That's a much better explanation that I was able to capture from like other stuff where I'd heard it referenced. So this is great. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing I teach primary supporting is like the initial entry into instrument conditions. Um, mm -hmm. Students hate it. It's kind of a little bit more difficult. Um, but then I teach control performance as the method to rely on in the event that you start losing instruments. Because if your airspeed yeah. indicator dies, I, you know, you can always go to six up and at full power. will give you 80 or three down and 1500. will give you 75 on the way down. My, yeah. my numbers could be a little off. It's been a while since I've flown a Cessna. Um, <laughs> all right. Now, <clears throat> we're under IFR conditions, cruising along, happy hunky-dory, and we all of a sudden, ATC's like, hey, I don't have radar coverage over, you, over there. Um, start making your mandatory reporting points. What do I need to tell them? Oh, my gosh. Well, if I see a... I got my chart. There's going to be some little filled in points. I have to tell them when I get to those. Okay. Now, and that's... I tell them if like life is changing, if my airspeed speeds up or slows down, or if I'm not going to be where I said I was going to be at the right time, um, I have to tell them. Okay. Um, now, let's say I start getting to my airport, right? The airport that I intend on landing, and they're still like, hey, I still don't have you on radar. Um, my radar must be cattywampus. I bet there's a deer standing in front of it. A deer's probably, you know, nice and medium rare because of how strong these radars are. Uh, radar, yeah. Uh, but for some reason, I still can't see you. And you start getting up close to your airport. Uh, what do you need to tell them when you start getting there? Let's say it's an uncontrolled airport with an ILS. Uh, well, 
I would have to tell them when I'm at my initial approach fix, I guess. And I mean, when you get to that fix, usually there, there's like a procedure turn or a hold or something like that. So if you're entering or leaving a hold, you have to tell them. All right. So yeah, reaching your final approach fix. Mm-hmm. Entering, leaving okay. a hold. Awesome. Awesome. Now, if you're cruising along and just your your COM2 just all of a sudden takes a crap on you, you're not using COM2. There's nothing tuned into COM2. You mainly use it for weather. Um, mm-hmm. Do you need to tell them? You know, I would tell them everything because it's free and they might want to know. But yes, I believe you are required to tell them if you have any loss of capability that is part of your IFR stuff. Mm-hmm. So if you lose anything more interesting than, you know, I, I, you don't have to tell them if the USB dies or the <laughs> XM radio or something like that. But I think everything else, if you lose a nav, even if you're not, even if you're all GPS, if you have a VOR or something like that, you have to tell them. Yep. Radio nav approach equipment failure. I had to tell, um, oh, what was it? I think it was Phoenix that I lost my ILS antenna while doing an ILS one time. That was funny. Uh-huh. Uh, I, Actually, I was, maybe I couldn't have said USB. I mean, if you're in your USB to charge your iPad, that's got all your charts. Maybe yeah. that's a thing. That would be kind of embarrassing, though. Yeah. And I've got charts on my, my MFD anyway, so just in case. Oh, dear Lord. It's one of the fancier G1000s. Um, I wasn't lucky enough to train in those. But I don't use it. I will admit I don't use the charts very much in the G1000 because, like, there's just so much you have to have on there. I like to have the map and the cumulative distances so you can tell people you're 10 miles out or whatever like that. And it just takes up a lot of space. So I still use the iPad for charts. Awesome. Um, I use my phone because it's one of those folding ones. Oh, my gosh. Is that better than an iPad? I mean, I could put it in my pocket. Okay, because um, I flew with a, I flew with a pilot who flies all the time, and he was like, "Should I get one of those?" I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, are you because he just used his phone, and it wasn't even like a big phone; it was just like phone and flight plan go, not even like flightware or anything, or you know, not not not, know, not even like Garmin Pilot or anything like that. Ooh, that's I mean, I guess no, no Garmin Pilot, no for flight. I don't know. So actually, I've been using flight plan go. This is like a hot take, but I think it's pretty good. I mean, I can get charts and I can put a chart on a map. What else do I need? And I know that with, um, you know, for flight, you can see everybody's comments and it'll track everything and tell you how much you're going to spend on fuel in the next 45 minutes or something. I don't know, based on, but right. for, for the free stuff it is, it's pretty, Flight Plan Go is kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, I used Flight Plan Go for a while. Um, I just got... I just really like how easy it is to use Garmin pilot. And, you know, I still have hopes okay. and I still have hopes and dreams that I'm actually going to install Garmin equipment into my airplane. And then I can just push my flight plans straight to the airplane. Yeah. So, um, you know, you know, maybe my mate, my ma- major airline pilot, she'll, you know, be able to afford, uh, <laughs> actually we we've got it budgeted out already. And, um, we got some G fives that we're ordering. It's going to be, I talked to Garmin at Oshkosh last year. The G5s are IP6. Uh, I don't know if they use the term IP6, but they said that they are generally waterproof and they are safe for seaplane operations. Okay, cool. So that's exciting. Um, awesome. I would trust them. They make stuff for boats. They make stuff for airplanes. They bring it all together. It's, yeah. Yeah. I I, I, I want to, like, I don't know if I if I... What I really want to do is convince them to give me like a, a G650 or not give me, but like let me buy a 650 that mm-hmm. has like a weight on water switch. So it'll switch from net aviation charts to boat charts as soon as I touch the water. Nice. Yeah, because you're in a boat all of a sudden. Yeah, exactly. That would be really nice because, I mean, again, Garmin makes both net, you know, aviation charts and boat charts. Why can't the screen display both? Do you need a fish finder? I have one. See, it just all comes together. <laughs> exactly. And I've used it too. It's, it's pretty funny. I, I've tried to go fishing out of my airplane a couple of times. So then the problem is that everyone just wants to come look at the airplane in the water. So I don't catch any damn fish. Oh yeah. Dang it. Um, all right. So we're cruising along on our IFR flight plan as we were talking about. Um, and your radio dies. Wah, wah, wah. Let's say you got uh, Com one and Com two. We already lost Com two, so we lost Com one also. Yep. For some reason, you know, you got to you 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 need to find a new mechanic, right? Com two circuit breaker popped. That thing died. Uh, now Com one. 
that circuit breaker popped. Um, I don't know who's working on your G1000, but I think they're like squishing wires together, pinching wires together. There's probably some bubble gum back there holding something together. Um, what are you going to do now that you've lost both of your radios? Okay, well, uh, after I'm done troubleshooting the radios, because, I mean, I'm not going to push the circuit breaker back in just a little bit and see if it pops out again. I don't know. Do all the troubleshooting I can. Try the other headset. Try the other thing. Um, I have to accept the fact that I have lost comms, squawk 7600 on my transponder, and continue doing what I am expected to do. So if I have been assigned an altitude, stay on that altitude. If I had been, um, if I, you know, had an approach that I was going to do and filed and all this stuff like that, which brings up some interesting questions in my head because I don't usually tell them in a flight plan what approach I'm going to do because I assume that you're going to get there and the runways could change and everything like that. It's interesting. But um, try to show up where you're expected to at the time that you said you were going to. So if even if you have to do a holding pattern for a while someplace, uh, you don't want to land early because they're going to know that you lost comms and clear the sky for you. Yep. Now, oh, okay. or try to find you know, uh, you know what? Actually, I forgot to try to go find some place without clouds and go land and troubleshoot your comps. That would have been a good thing to say in there. VFR, yeah. go find VFR. Well, not necessarily go find VFR, but if in VFR conditions, continue flight under VFR and land as soon as practical. Okay. Right. Yeah. Like if I'm in soup, I'm not going to deviate from the plan that I've got because I think like I've heard it was nice out there. Yeah. Okay. Um. But if like I'm in soup and then I'm continuing on on my planned route and then all of a sudden I break out into clear. OK, I'm landing. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I'll give you a little bit of a craft clearance and then we'll just kind of go through that when it comes to a loss com. Right. Okay. So uh, you are cleared from the India Whiskey Airport or India Whiskey Alpha Airport. To the Stanfield VOR with an EFC of, oh, uh, what's the current local, or what's the Zulu time? EFC of 2240 Zulu, climb maintain 4,000, expect 8,000 10 minutes after departure. Departure frequency 12345, squawk 12345. I take off immediately into the soup, lose my comps. What else do my climbing to? 4,000 feet. Okay. Now I'm continuing on. They pretty much cleared me direct to the Stanfield VOR. It's been about 10 minutes. What altitude am I going to now? 8,000 feet. Awesome. Um, since they didn't clear me along any routes, I have no MEAs, no MO or you no know, MEAs, MOCAs or anything like that. Right. Um, <clears throat> now I got to the Stanfield VOR at 22 or, uh, 2228 Zulu. What am I going to do now? Well, they said expect further clearance at 2240 Zulu. Mm -hmm. And I'm going all the way to Tucson. Tucson's my destination. Stanfield VOR does not have an approach off of it. Okay. Well, I guess at 2240 Zulu, can you assume that you are clear to Tucson? Yeah. I'm not supposed to be asking. The questions i'm supposed to be telling you confident answers but yeah uh, proceed to a fix from which an approach begins and start an approach okay right so okay what my plan was right if you filed something you're going to continue on your filed plan to a fix in which an approach starts from right okay so if you heard that uh mnemonic uh, mea and avenue f mm -hmm. yeah so awesome uh, procedure turns. We'll go over that when we start looking at plates. We already went over that. Airspace, you're a pilot. You should understand airspace by now. Um, I'm happy. Ooh, where's my little notes about holding speeds? Because I don't want to ask the question when I don't have the answers like right in front of me because I even I have to look this yeah, stuff we, up. Uh, like what's your limits and all? Yeah, what's your speed limits in a hold and based on what altitude? Oh my gosh. Um, I'm going to, I 200 knots at 7,000 feet or less or something like that. I don't know. I'm in a Cessna 172. I Cessna know. That's mine. Um, 
There it is, holding speed. So 6,000 or below, 200 knots, 6,001 to 14,000, 230, 14 and 1, and above 245, Air Force and Navy, uh, you got 310 and 230. Um, now, also, the, the other response is, um, if I can't safely maintain that speed, right? So if I'm in a fully loaded Airbus, uh, there's no way I'm slowing down to 200 knots unless I start dropping flaps. Okay. Right. Um, but again, you know, you're not you're not going to get an instrument rating in an Airbus. Awesome. Now, let's start looking at some charting. Now, do you have some kind of possible cross country procedures that we could or not cross country procedures, but cross country plan that your examiner might have given you or whatnot, um, just so that we can get at least as close as practical to what you're actually or as pl close as possible to what you're actually going to experience? Um, I, no, I haven't been told to, I haven't been told to plan anything yet. Okay. Or I haven't scheduled anything yet. So we're oh. still a little bit away. All right. So um, for, my, for my long cross country, uh, we went from Wichita to Lawrence. So I pick some airports. Yeah. So what was a uh, Lawrence? What's the identifier for that one? Uh, let's see here. Lawrence. Kansas. Oh, that's definitely it's funny. I could not keep it in my head at the time find it okay no, Going that's... maps here. Hmm. let's see there's Topeka. okay lwc lima whiskey charlie is lawrence regional i was way off i was trying all kinds of other things that i thought it might be and no not even anywhere close see why it's I, I can never describe it but i had to just write it down and stare at it it could not stay in my head but it was the first time i've flown there and you know fun time all right. Well, since we've got this, can you see this pretty well or no? No, I really cannot at all. But okay. I can put in something similar. All right. Well, um, what I'm going to plan for is the Wichita, directly to the Wichita VOR. Um, okay. And then, oh, you have GPS. I'm, 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 so, sp <laughs> I'm so used to filing VORs to VORs. Um, but we'll go with that because that's just the easiest way to do it. Uh, for me to make sure I know where we're at. Then from there, I'm going to go Emporia. EMP, I've been there before. K-E-M-P. Okay. Okay. And then I think I'm going to take it to Who's, H-O-O-Z, and call that the end of my plan. Um, yeah, Victor 112, awesome. Okay, so we're starting at Wichita, right? And then mm -hmm. we're going to Emporia. Emporia to who's to Lawrence? Uh, no, so we're going Wichita, VO, Wichita VOR, uh, mm -hmm. Emporia, mm -hmm. who's Lawrence. Gotcha, with you. Okay, I got awesome. it. Awesome. So continuing on along the route, what's expected out of me when I go to actually depart this place? What, what is there any approach, uh, or not approach, is there any procedure that I would do on the way out of Wichita or am I just expected, you know, climb up to the Maroka or climb up to the appropriate altitude that I've been assigned? Um, I don't remember. Hold on. I can, I can look up and see real quick if Wichita has a non-standard approach or not. Um, no, not even necessarily a non-standard approach. Like, what procedure could I use to leave? Do I have any procedures that would be appropriate for departing uh, Wichita? Oh, well, I don't know. Wichita is a Class C airspace, so I'm going to do whatever they tell me to do. Okay, well, what I'm getting at is they don't, at least from the charts that I'm looking at, they don't mm -hmm. They don't have a SID or a uh, an ODP. This is true. Oh, yeah, they don't. Right? We don't have anything else. So what's the difference between a SID and an ODP? Or I guess what is what do those acronyms mean? Um, set a standard distribution departure. So, I mean, it's a big map. I've never done it before. And it tells you exactly where to go. But standard, uh, standard departure is we're just going to take off and fly runway heading, um, at 200 feet per nautical mile until I'm 400 feet above the ground. And then I'm going to make whatever turn I want to. All right. Now I'm trying to find a... That's a star. Do they not? There we go. There's a. So I'm looking down at OKC 
at the <laughs> Funnel 3 Arnav. And what I want you to do is I want you to tell me if you could do this this departure procedure. Okay, see. The Funnel After. 3 Arnav. Okay. This is fun. So Let's see here. It says um, standard with uh, takeoff minimums. You have to have a minimum climb of 500 foot per nautical mile to 1800. Okay. Um, that's close enough that if it was like a crazy hot day, I would go calculate my performance in a 172 and make sure I can make it. Cause I just know from looking at it that it's kind of right there. Okay. So let's say cool day. We can do that 500 feet per nautical mile up to 1800 feet. Okay. Anything else on this where I might not be able to do it? Climb to, I'm just looking at the takeoff for the runways, departure route description, climb to 1800, climb to 1800, and the right turn. Um, I don't see any problems. I mean, all the altitudes are, you know, 2,500 or I don't have to climb to 10,000 feet. No, you can do it. It's not no problem at all. Okay. Yeah, then I can do it. Awesome. Um, just be confident about it. That'd be my only response to that one. You know, once you're kind of to the point where you're like, hey, yeah, I could do this through it. Go for it. Because um, <clears throat> the amount of times even I have been asked on a check ride, are you sure? Even after I answered the question correctly, I'm like, you know, until you said, until you asked. Or now uh, that yeah. You, yeah. Now that you asked, no. <laughs> If you wouldn't have asked. Um, all right. So as I'm climbing out of Wichita, how do I know what altitude I need to climb up to to be safe? Well, I can pull up a Wichita approach and uh, see what the recommended is. Well, or there's, there's an Aroka right in the middle of this thing that says 4,200 feet. So if I'm cruising around there, I'm great. I don't even need to be on an airway. Awesome. Because we're not on an airway when we're going from Wichita straight to that VOR. Truth. Right. Um, obviously, if we're under IFR conditions, you know, they should be vectoring us and we should be fine. Right. Right. Um, let me grab my notes just to make sure I don't miss anything. So what I hate the most as an instructor is like, I'm more than happy to admit when I'm wrong. But I hate not being able to like eventually get to being right because I don't want to like just leave y'all with questions being like, well, you know, there's a question. Let's I guess we'll figure it out later. Uh, That's not bad. The only people watching this are other instrument students getting ready for a check ride who should be looking stuff up all the time. Like I should be like all the stuff that I didn't know, you know, so. Uh, I mean, to be honest, you haven't been uh, doing too doing too bad. Like I've you know, I've definitely done some of these that have. Definitely been going a whole lot worse. You know, no shame to any other student. It's just, you know, training is still required for some other students. Um, okay. Because, man, I am thinking I want to be so much snappier on yeah. 90% of these answers. So your your answers are generally correct. There's just not a whole lot of confidence in them. Um, uh -huh. And I don't know if you saw that little post from Instagram, you know, one of the main things that we're checking on an instrument check, right? Obviously, we're checking knowledge, depth of knowledge, and really the confidence of the answer, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's the, the that's kind of a there's kind of two reasons for that. Uh, one is, you know, if a student's not confident, they're going to be questioning themselves all the time when they're actually out there flying around. Uh, the other time is, you know, some of these DPEs are um, they're up there in years and they're not really nice to people that. Uh, aren't confident in their answers. They're just like, well, they're going to be unsafe in the air if they're not, you know, given confident answers all the time, snappy, you know, military style responses. Um, uh -huh. And that's, and I hate hearing that. Right. So we're cruising along on this route that we planned and we're coming up on uh, Victor 12. What's that number above that Victor 12, that first Victor 12. <clears throat> what is uh, that? 3,600. Yep. Uh, that is your MRA. So is it where your... you can cruise along and get nav signal? Okay. Now is it my MRA? 
<clears throat> or is it the MEA? It is the MEA. Now, what does MEA guarantee me? Sorry. Um, obstacle. Uh, you're, you are safely, uh, we're not in a mountainous area, so you're safely 1,000 feet from obstacles. Okay. It also guarantees me NAV coverage. MEA is NAV and obstacles. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, what's this R? What's this little flag with the R on it? It's just past Victor 12. Um, that's a reporting point. Now that one's an MRA. There's the MRA. It says it right beneath it. INDC, uh, Indic, uh -huh. right? MRA yep. of 4,500, right? So if I'm below okay. 4,500, what am I risking? You might not have a nav signal. I might not have a nav signal, right? I'm going to be out. I, I'm going to be outside the service volume of the Wichita VOR. Okay. Right. Um, it's still possible that there'll be a nav signal, but there's no guarantee that there still will be a nav signal. Yes. Um, continuing on our route, we've got another VOR. What is this little Z right here on Victor 502 between Jayhawk and Kissery? Uh, K-I-C-R-E and Jayhawk. There's a little Z looking thing right between them. Let's see here. We've got plus more. Um, so the altitudes are different on either side of that little jog thing. Okay. Is it? Is or, it wait. Hmm. Sorry. No, no, you're fine. So I'll I'm just look, I'll just tell you no. That's those aren't altitudes. Okay. All right. What else could they be? Uh, it could be a halfway point between VORs. That doesn't sound right at all. Gosh, my mind is blank. Well, it's not a. It's not necessarily a halfway point. It's called a changeover point. Okay. Okay. So changeover point. Um, what it's showing you on the forty, it's showing you it's forty miles from this previous VOR. And the 49 uh -huh. is showing you that it's 49 miles to the next VOR. It's telling you, you need to change between the VOR you're leaving to the VOR uh -huh. you're going to, to maintain signal. That's great. Change of a point. Okay. I see it. Yeah. This was all on that written test that I passed <laughs> over a year ago. Now my mind is gone. No, no, come on. Um, these are things okay. that everybody misses and that's the point of a mock check ride. Right. Um, Great. I don't know if you've seen in some of the comments, people are like, what are these questions? This guy is digging in way too far. And that's the thing. I would rather dig in nine miles and the DPE ask you two inches of questions and send you on your way. Um, but this is what DPEs do. Like, especially if they find something you don't know, then they just have to like dig at it. Like, this is great. Exactly. Now, since we talked about our changeover point, what's this mm -hmm. one right here over at Wetzel? Wetzel is the next fix that I'm looking at. It's a tri yeah. it's the triangle with the two lines butting up against it. What's that one? <clears throat> That's the one with different altitudes on either side. That is the different altitudes on either side. What's the 30 okay. right underneath it? So we got Wetzel 30 with an arrow and that little like rounded box thing. That's a DME distance. Awesome. I am happy with those. Hmm. What else do I? Oh, there's one down here that I really like. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? There it is. What's this? That's not an airway anymore. That closed airway, not an airway anymore. I like it. Um, now, where's our route? There's our route. Let's see if I can punch you into somewhere weird. In Kansas, there might not be anything weird. Yeah, I'm struggling to find some weird stuff. It's um, not very weird. No, no. Let's change our route to like, we're just going to be absolutely ridiculous. And uh, we're going to go to that fix. If I got cleared, <clears throat> Wichita... Wichita VOR straight up to glide. 
Okay. What's this? A little blue. Uh, that's a little restricted area. Am I cleared through it? Uh, I've flown through them while I was talking to VOR, VFR flight following before, so they could tell you that you're cleared through it. All right, but if I'm but, on an IFR flight plan and this is what my clearance is, cleared Wichita VOR, straight to glide, mm -hmm. direct glide, and then, you know, on route as appropriate. Does mm -hmm. that count as a clearance through the restricted area? That's a great question. I'd feel a little nervous and I would ask for clarification. You're cleared through it. Okay. Right. Great. Because the, who do you have to talk to when it comes to a restricted area? The controlling agency, right? Right. Well, who's the controlling agency of this restricted airspace? <laughs> Probably the controller that you're talking to. And yeah. if it's not, they've talked to the other controller. Have you ever like asked a controller for like a change or a route, uh, a direct to or anything like that? Mm -hmm. All right. And have they ever told you like, stand by, I got to, uh, you know, I got to get on the phone or I got to talk to the next guy? Yeah. That's what they're yeah. doing. All right. They're, they're coordinating this the entire way. Um, okay. Yeah. Cause I called for a clearance once like from the ground, like on one of these cross country things, like there was no tower. And so we just had to practice like literally call Kansas city center and it took a while. They had to talk to a bunch of other people and then I got a clearance. All right. Um, now what is that? What did, what did you call that? Cause you got a clearance. What did I call? Yeah, so you called uh, Kansas City Center or Wichita Center or whatever it happened to be, and they gave you a yeah. clearance, right? What else did they give you? Uh, they said, void if you're not off in 10 minutes. Okay. Now, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, We call it a clearance void time. Oh, yes. Yeah, they that's... Void. Okay. All right. Um, trying to see if we got any other weird ones. Just to make sure. Why is this route blue and this route black? Oh, I've heard this before. The blue one is for, well, I mean, what's the altitude on that blue one say? It's like 2,800 mm -hmm. GPS. Oh, 2,800. That's not that bad. Okay. I just saw the little G. Yeah. Um, so you need GPS to fly it. Yeah. It's a GPS route. Um, okay. Now, what about, what is this blue 3000 G above it? If you have GPS, you can fly 3000 feet. Okay. Now, what do I call it? Is that my Mocha, my Oroka, my, you know, MRA, my. Uh, it's another MEA. Uh, I, GPS altitude. Yeah, um, it's a, it's a GPS MEA. Oh, okay. GPS MEA. I like it. All right. Um, and that's the thing. Those are some of those questions where it's just like, that's so simple. Like, what are you, what are you asking me about? Like, that's, that's, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. What are you, what are you asking? Um, I know that the G is for GPS. I didn't know I'd have to know anything else. Yeah. <laughs> uh, awesome. Now let's look at Lawrence Regional and let's talk about, uh, you know, you want to just give me an approach briefing for the ILS runway 33 um, into Lawrence. Oh, man. OK, hold on. Let me pull it up. Hey, LWC, because I immediately forgot what the code was. ILS 33? ILS 33. OK. Sure. So we're flying. So if we we're flying along. I'd be making sure all the stuff agrees on my display as I'm briefing the approach. We're at the ILS 33 into Lawrence Regional. Make sure it's OK on the display. It's a 5,700 foot runway, which we can make because I only need like a little over a thousand feet and 172 for like the whole thing. Um, 831 is the elevation. Uh, I don't see anything in these little notes. They do have non-standard take off minimums. Um, the best approach procedure is to climb 2000 and then climbing right turn to 3100 to new direct new bin LOM and hold outer marker and hold. Okay. We're going to get our weather from 121, 225. Hopefully already did that. We were talking to Kansas city center at 1238. Next frequency we'll talk to is the Unicom 123, so I'll have that programmed in. The um, MSA is 3100, so we'll make sure we stay there unless we are established, until we're established on the approach. We're going to land on 
runway three three today it says SILS. That's a straight in approach. Minimums is ten thirty one. So I program that into Barrowman, and that's uh, all I feel like I need to brief. Okay. Do you have any? Um, my personal, you know, approach to, uh, you know, no pun intended approaches, uh, or approach briefings is kind of telling a story. Um, the one thing I would add to yours, not saying there's anything, um, wrong with not telling a story, you covered all the appropriate material. Uh, mm-hmm. the reason I tell it in the story is cause that's just how my brain works. Right. I tell, I talk about it in the way that we're going to do it. Right. Um, plus people pay more attention to stories. Okay. Okay. Uh, the only thing I would add to yours is where's the MSA from? Right. Like, what do you mean? Like, what is the oh. reference point? If, what, what is the reference point of the MSA? Cause the MSA is only 25 miles, but where is it in reference to? And I know in your airplane, you know, in a Cessna 172, that's not really that big of a concern because you know, you don't like, it's going to take you a half hour to cross 25 miles. Um, mm-hmm. But what's the reference point of it? Uh, this Nubin outer marker. Yep. Right. Okay. Sometimes they're the sometimes they're the runway end identify or they're the runway end. Sometimes they're the beacon. Sometimes they're the airport identifier. Um, mm-hmm. You know, sometimes they're outer markers. Sometimes they're VORs, like two miles away from the field. Okay. Okay. Um, and not even necessarily maintaining thirty one hundred until established on the approach. Uh, if I lose situational awareness, I'm going up to thirty one hundred. Okay. All right. Yes. Um, and I know in Kansas, we're not really worried about, you know, obstructions. Um, all the mountains. <laughs> yeah. All the mountains. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, other than that, I, I, you covered the pertinent information, I guess, um, localizer frequency I might bring up. Uh, I know your G1000 does it all for you. It does, but you're right. I should still confirm. I, I should still, I do want to confirm that 108.9 automatically got shoved into the little nav one and two things up there. Mm-hmm. And I also really should mention that we're going to do a procedure turn when we get to the approach fix. Yep. Um, and the, I like to bring up the identifier as well um, because there's no guarantee that you're picking up the appropriate one. Uh, I do this to students in the 320 sim all the time. I'll turn on an ILS at an airport, like eight miles away. And they'll yeah. pick up that ILS and they'll start following it, wondering why they don't see their airport of intended landing in front of them. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> All right. So it's not just 108.9, but 108.9 JZM. Okay. Right. Because um, your, your, your airplane can do that. Right. Your airplane can show you yeah, the, the yeah. Right. Um, so if I was to brief this, I'd just be like, hey, we're doing the ILS runway uh, 33 in uh, Lawrence, chart number, et cetera. Looks like we're going to do a procedure turn at the um, outer marker at 3,100, then grab the glide slope at 2,900 again at the outer marker and follow that down to our minimums of 1031. None of the notes apply to us. If we don't break out by 1031, I'm going to do the missed approach, climb 2,000, then climbing right turn 3,100, direct to Newbum and hold, and we'll probably try it again from there, if I do make it down, uh, we've got 5,700 feet of runway. Touchdowns on elevations 831. It looks like it's going to be a left turn off. You got any comments, questions, or concerns? Uh, sorry, frequency 108.9, jism in the top. All right. Um, I, I know a lot of people, you know, when they're at their instrument rating, you did a pretty good job. You covered the pertinent information. A lot of people, what they end up doing is they end up just reading the whole plate. Uh-huh. And the DPE, st- or, you know, the other person in the seat, the DPE, whatever, stopped paying attention two minutes in. Got okay. it. Because um, remember, what's the point of an approach briefing? To create a shared mental model in the flight deck. Yeah. Right. And make sure you didn't, you know, forget to get ATIS or forget to put your Unicom in the right thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like the idea of, um, you know, Using this part, because you're kind of trying to go sequentially. I like the idea of briefing the runway length and elevation down here after you talk about how you're going to get into the approach and then talk about how you're going to the runway. Because I've been talking about it when it's up here, but like, you're not ready. I like the story. Yeah. Um, And that's just how I've done it 
like I have, I've been telling stories of like how I'm going to do what I'm going to do since I was in private pilot. Cause that's Monica, my flight instructor from ATP in Arizona. That's how she told me. She's like, tell me a story. I was like, okay, well my grandma did this when I was a kid. She's like, no, you're stupid. Tell me a story about what we're going to do. <laughs> Um, good yeah, yeah. Uh, and, but I've, I've, I've used that the entire time. And it was funny when I flew with my wife at the airlines one time, I did that. And that was the first time she'd ever seen there, like heard somebody like tell a story of like how to taxi and like what we were going to do. She's like, what are you doing? Just, get <laughs> um, just it's chatty. Yeah. Oh. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we got to fly. Uh, we, we got to fly one full trip together and she was the captain. It was awesome. Oh, um, awesome. now why is this VOR DME alpha and not VOR DME runway? Same let's airport, see. Lawrence. Yep. Uh, let's see here. Well, it's bringing you in at a uh, the, the heading is 111. And that doesn't line up with any particular runway. So you would have to circle to land on them using this approach. Okay. So what's the limit? What's the minimum? No, 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 no. Oh, oh. Oh, it's um, 30 degrees. 30 degrees, right? Um, have you ever done an approach that's actually 30 degrees off? No, but I was shocked to find out that it could be 30 degrees off and still be called straight in. I feel like I'd be a little caught off guard if I was expecting a runway straight ahead of me and it was 30 degrees off. So if, if you get the chance, I don't know if you got like Microsoft Flight Simulator, you have access to a simulator. Uh, mm -hmm. go, there's a VOR approach into Coolidge, Papa 08 in Arizona. And okay. uh, I think it is, a, it is substantially off course. Let's just go look at the, the approach. And it's also a an approach that you're leaving a VOR. The VOR isn't on the field, so it's getting less and less sensitive the closer you get to the airport. Uh-huh. Okay, so your course is 07 and the runway is 5. So it's oh 21 gosh. degrees off. Uh-huh. And you end it is it is nuts. Yep. Um, but okay, but you know what? That's funny though is that the, the straight in minimums are exactly the same as the circling <laughs> minimum. So it's almost like they admit that you might as well just consider it a circling approach. Yep, yep. And I mean, there's obstacles and stuff. I mean, it is Arizona. Um, but mm -hmm. this one is going to, this one you end up pretty far off course because again, the VOR is getting less and less sensitive the, the closer you get to the airport. Wow. Right? Um, right. This one was. I like doing this one. This one, this one threw a lot of students for a loop. Um, cause I think I'm trying to get the total distance. Um, yeah, you end up something like 20 miles away from the VOR. Awesome. All right. And this is another one where I talk about the MSAs. If we look at the MSA on the Papa 08 VOR runway five, the MSA is huh. 5,800, 25 nautical miles from the Stanfield VOR. Your missed approach point is like 20 miles from the Stanfield VOR. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So I guess after you go miss, uh, get up to 5,800, unless you're going to be right back on that course. Well, yeah. I mean, go missed. And, you know, if you have to go missed, go do the published missed is appropriate. But if you lose situational awareness, um, mm -hmm. it can be a little bit more dangerous. You need to immediately start either tracking laterally or like doing an arc around the Stanfield VOR to stay within the MSA. Yep. Um, and that's why I say, that's why I bring up like, Hey, make sure to brief where the state, where the MSA is in reference to. Yeah. Because if you okay. thought it was 25 miles from the V from the airport, you're over here smacking into uh Newman's peak down here at the bottom. That's what that mountain is. That's Newman's peak. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cause on this approach, it says you can, you can be doing this initial, you know, holding pattern at 3,500 feet. And there's a 4,500 foot mountain to the right. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. This one is, is, is God, I miss teaching in Arizona. <laughs> now I might just miss teaching in Arizona because I don't know where all of the fun gotchas are in the rest of the dang world. <laughs> um, there is not a gotcha like this in uh, Kansas. I can tell you that. No, no. Um, 
let me dig through my notes. And, you know, you wanted to dig into some notums to see if there's anything that really applies. So let's go to I'm trying to remember, because I always just get notums off of my phone. Can you get notums on aviationweather.gov? No, you can't. You go to notums or I, something. I can get notums off uh, Flight Plan Go. All right, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna go to the DNA or you know Defense Internet Notum Service. Um, yeah. And well, let's look at Notums for the airport we were just uh, LWC and KICT. View Notums. All right, because. Uh, What's up? No, oh, no, I'm just I'm just looking at the it says for GPS runway one five LNAV NDA thirteen sixty hat five twenty nine all paths. All right. Well, what's, uh, the, what's the MDA normally? That's a question. Well, I'm seeing all kinds of fun ones at at Wichita because, like, remember Wichita you still need to check like your approach notums and everything at your airport of departure, because what happens if you have to go back? Oh yeah, that's true. Right. So, um, yeah. Wichita always has 900 taxiway closures <laughs> depending on who is doing construction today or I don't know. There's always a notum for like we're mowing or something. I, that's why I'm, I'm so worried that I'm going to like miss an important notum in the ocean of, all the notums. Yeah. Like I, I love the ones where it's like, you know, increased bird activity has been a notum at green Bay for like a decade. Uh, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, are you sure this isn't just like normal bird activity? At oh. some point it's not a notum. Yeah. yeah. You're right. At some point, this is just the standard bird activity. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, this one's a really funny one. If we look at ICT for, um, looks like ILS runway one left is unusable from DA to touchdown zone. Duh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I shouldn't be descending below DA purely on ILS, right? So I shouldn't be using it down there anyway. Um, And then we've got nav runway or ILS runway one nine right is also uh, unusable. So we know if I'm departing, I can't like maybe Wichita isn't. What other approaches do I have in Wichita in the event that I need to come back? Right. We know we the ILS one left is fine. ILS one nine right is unusable. What other ones are an option? Sure. Um, you know, if I was a DPE and I was digging through notums, I would say like, hey, what if you took off and then. Uh, you noticed maybe some high, some oil temp that was creeping up and you couldn't seem to get it into control under control. Like, Hey, we took off of uh, runway one nine, right. And on our way out of one runway one nine, right. You took off in the high and you had a little bit of high oil temperature. What would your plan be? Well, if you didn't check the notums, your plan might be turn around, grab the ILS and come back in on one left or other way around. We took off a of one left and we're climbing out of one left you know, you got that high oil temp. What are we going to do? My initial response, if I didn't check the notums, would be turn around, grab the one nine right on the way in. Yeah. Well, good thing we checked the notums. Bad idea. But again, though, Wichita Class C Tower, they're going to tell you what approach that you are going to be using. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Do they close? Wichita does not, now. Oh. Good. You know the tower doesn't close. That's what my response would be. Well, I'm going to tell the tower and they're going to tell me what to do. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yep. Um, now, now on the other side, I'm, I'm flying out of an airport on the east side of town more that does have a tower that closes. And that's what, that's been part of my challenge because I learned, I got my private out of KICT tower always telling me what to do. And on, you know, smaller airports, you're just not used to like having to make all those traffic decisions yourself and, well, what was the what was the other airport that you might be going out of? Beach, BEC. BEC. Yeah, Jabara is a uh, yeah. Well, I'll look at the notums for that one too. Uh, that's Wichita. I don't, think, I don't think there are any. No, uh, there is runway one nine and one is closed. Tomorrow, right? Yep. 
Yep. I know what that. It's a party. It's a party? Like what's like is it actually a party or is it just it's causing a disaster with flight training in the area? No, it's a uh there's like a 5k run. <laughs> so so we were all warned. Like up and yeah. down the runway or Yeah, it's part of it, yeah. Huh. Isn't that fun? I yeah. You can use runways for all kinds of stuff. We have to tell everybody. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's a in Arizona again, there's a oh, what was the name of that airport? I don't know. I only went there once and then they immediately told us we weren't ever allowed to go there again. Um, but uh, they have a drag race down the runway like once a year. Yeah. yeah, I've heard of this. Like they'll use the runways for drag racing and whatever else the heck they want. Actually, someone in Arizona told me that they use them for drag racing and they don't necessarily always tell you. So they're like. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Well, that's why they told us we weren't allowed to go there anymore because they were doing that. All right. And they were putting up like the cinder blocks barriers down the center line stripe to separate the cars doing the drag strip or doing the drag race, yeah. but then not telling anybody that they were closing the runway for the drag race. Oh, gosh. Yeah, exactly. So. Yep. Um, I'm not seeing anything really too concerning. You know, you've got some cat two, some cat three uh, approach notums. Uh, you've got one nine right ILS out of service. Uh, a yeah. bunch of towers. Uh, try not to smack a tower. Yeah. Um, looks like for the GPS in the Wichita, one right. Um, looks like there's an inoperative. If the, there's an inoperative Mauser, increase the LPV category E to three quarter mile. Um, I guess you're not in category E. Um, LNAV VNAV, all cat visibility, RVR of one and one eighth. LNAV cat C, D, and E. Yeah, it's not applicable to you. But it looks like, but you don't, you also don't use RVR, but that's one and one eighth mile. So. Okay. I have to know what RVR means and everything, right? It's a thing on a chart. Yeah. For it's, this. But yeah, yeah. You, you do need to know what RVR means. And I mean, it's, it's really just feet. Yeah, that, that that's what it means. Right. Um, so RVR of one and an eighth mile is your minimum if the for an inoperative Malzar on runway one. Right. If you're doing the GPS to runway one. Right. Um, Great. I know I would probably miss that one. They've got some VOR notams A VOR from zero two five to zero three five surface to four thousand feet is unusable. Yeah, that's interesting. I've seen that one. Um, I don't think that one's been there for a while. Yeah, that one's been there for a while. I don't think you're worried about the wingspan one of 79 feet. Um, uh, my wingspan is significantly less than, yeah, it's the 80 foot wingspan 172. If you're not familiar with it. No, no, I, I must have, I must have missed that one. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it doesn't seem runway one. Five. So there is an adjustment to the MDA. On uh -huh. the LNAV for runway 15 into Lawrence Regional. So if that ends up being on your check ride, you can see your LNAV MDA changes to 1360. Uh, height above touchdowns, 529 for all categories. What I actually do is if you can draw on your approach plates on your iPad, draw the notums oh, yeah. in. Oh, that's a good idea. Yes, right? I can. Um, so like put a little line over it, tight, right? You know, L LNAV MDA of 1360 so you don't miss it. I even okay. do that at the airlines. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't see, like, there's a few instrument approaches. Oh, yeah, the um, standard LDAV MDA is 1340. So that's actually kind of a big deal. Yeah. I You're mean, it's, it by 20 feet. Yeah, yeah, it's 20 feet, but the last thing you want to do is bust through the bottom, hanging out at 1340 and a DP just sitting over there in silence. And as soon as you touch the ground, he's like, well, you busted minimums. And you're like, no, but the chart. And he's like, yeah, but the notum. Oh, that'd be so mean. <laughs> but remember, check rides aren't, uh, they're not an opportunity for instruction. Uh, there are no second chances. Um, yeah. I know that kind of sucks. Uh, but I don't know. I know I was kind of a, uh, I held that to a T when I was doing stage checks for UND. These are not opportunities for instruction. Um, some people hated me for it, but remember, people aren't going to go out and have, you know, you're not going to call your instructor and go, hey, can I do this approach? And they're going to go, who, 
who is this? I deleted your number as soon as you finished your check ride. No, oh. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, uh, what you call it? I do get new phone. It was, it, it was, I did have to do that one time. I got a text from somebody that like, it was one of my students from years ago and they were like, thank you. You helped me through such and such rating. I just made it to this airline. And I'm like, uh-huh. who new is phone. this <laughs> new phone? Who this? Oh, that's so mean. Um, but no, I, I eventually remembered who they were, but either way, um, that's okay. I think you recognize the parts that you need to study. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't terrible. I've definitely seen worse. Um, <sighs> charts, maybe just read through the key a little bit more, get a little bit more comfortable with the reading, the actual sectional, um, yeah. would kind of be my takeaway there. Um, yeah, the... I agree. In addition to my, to my my one note card cheat sheet that I made, I had printed out the little departure percentage charts and everything like that, so I can just, I'll just stare at it. I'm just going to hang out in life. I'm just going to stare at this. Family's watching TV. Stare at this. It'll be so fulfilling. You know, staring at things never really seemed to work for me when studying. Um, yeah, I, it's not. I would build scenarios in which, like, each one of those symbologies became evident in that scenario. Oh, I, okay. That will help. Yes. You know, um, because remember our, our, our dumb, dumb lizard brains don't like, they don't remember stuff by staring at it. They remember stuff based on like, how did I get there? And was there food when I got there? Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. So just hijack those two, like dumb, dumb lizard brain things, right? How did I get there? Well, I got there via following yep. this part of the sectional, right? Yeah. And then when you remember it, like eat a cookie or something, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. There were Cheez-Its. <laughs> yeah. After that uh, crossover. Uh, you know, so just hijacking those little bits of your brain to, it really helps with studying, especially an instrument because the instrument there, it is heavy on symbology and learning new words and mm-hmm. it's rough. Um, and all the little numbers and all of the, what's an airspeed in a holding pattern. And yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot building okay. a scenario. I don't know if you do much in like Microsoft flight sim or you have access to a simulator. Um, that really helps a lot. Okay. Um, what were you saying? Uh, there, I, I have access to like a kiosk, you know, we'll do 1000 so I can fake we're in demo mode and I'm at 3000 feet and what else do you want to go to? And so I do, I do a lot on that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, your, your procedures there are probably great. And I know that's where a lot of students struggle is, you know, just being able to fly the airplane and press the buttons. I know that's where mm-hmm. I struggled a lot too. Cause I'd end up focusing on like twisting the knob and like a, B, C, D, E, F, G. Ah, damn, I passed it. <laughs> and next thing you know, I look up and I'm six miles off course. <laughs> you know how many times I wanted to, uh, I tried to engage approach mode and I accidentally hit the autopilot off because they both have AP and I'm, I feel like I'm very smart until I'm in an airplane flying and then I make like the IQ plummets and I'm like, dang it, I did it again. Do you have a nice headset? Yeah, a Bose. Oh, okay. What is that? What I've noticed is students that don't have noise canceling headsets, the noise gets to them. Um, Wow. Yeah. And the way I compare it is like, try learning calculus while I'm screaming in your ear. Yeah, there's got to be something to it. Yeah, you're, you're not going to be able to do it. And then as soon as you put on a noise counseling headset or like, you know, you, you start trying to learn calculus in a quiet classroom. Yeah, it all of a sudden makes sense. I lie. I, the calculus just still doesn't make any sense to me. But either way, <laughs> that's the comparison I, had, I like to make. I had to brain dump all of it for this. Yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, now, I know at the beginning of this, I did say that there is, uh, I, I generally don't like study guides. And the reason I don't like study guides is because they can be wrong and they also don't give you sources. Um, okay. I like the Pilots Cafe IFR study guide because it tells you where to look for the rest yeah. of the information, right? I have that. Um, that one, I absolutely love. Um, and even I use it as kind of like a, hey, I'm going to look here and then I'm going to go look at the actual reg that's associated with it. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, another good teaching, me- another good, like kind of way to memorize these things or, you know, do well in IFR. 
Um, I made flashcards and I'd study my flashcards and I'd hand my flashcards off to somebody else and just have them yeet them at me randomly to see if I could yeah. remember what was on them. Yeah. Right. That's true. Flashcards help. Um, uh, the quiz, the Quizlet app has, you can make your own flashcards and people make flashcards and there are IFR, I, you know, oral flashcards. Now, again, I don't know who the heck those people are and they could be telling me all the wrong stuff, but so far it's been pretty good. Yeah. And that was, I've seen them cause I've, I've, like, to be honest, I've made them for like every type rating I, I've, I've ever done. There are like flashcards on Quizlet that I've made for uh, for whatnot. But again, like okay. mistakes. I, 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 I've gone through my flashcards at a later date and I went, oh, that's wrong. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's terrifying. Nice. Um, I tried to delete them, but, you know, just a just a thought. Right. The people can make mistakes. Yes. Um, let me just look through my notes, make sure there's not any other big things. But um not check ride ready, but you're getting there, right? Um, <laughs> I'm not trying to be mean. Yeah. Um, no, that's just fine. I've got, luckily, I've got a week or two, so. Yeah. Um, so definitely get back in the books for a little bit. Um, you know the Instrument Flying Handbook. The um, Instrument Procedures Handbook is another really good one. Um, yeah. Man, this book is, like, the most boring. Like, speaking of how do you learn, I can't. I started to read it, and it just does not sink in. No. And that's the thing. I hate those books. I I've taught wow. students. Yeah. I've, I've taught students. They're like, look, I bought this thing from ASA. It's going to help. And I'm like, throw it away. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Because as you just explained, it's boring. It's dry. It gives you like, it, it gives you an answer that it's like expected for you to memorize it. Yes. But, and then it doesn't really direct you to more guidance. Does it? Uh, no, actually, you're right. It does not. Yeah. Describe a level significant weather chart. It goes from 10,000 feet to flight level 450. And it's depicted in 24-hour mid-level and, and it gets updated four times a day. I I don't know. Yeah, and it's like, okay, well, where where are we finding that information? What book did that come from? Mm -hmm. You know, is it in the AIM? Is it in the PHAC? Is it in the aviation weather book? Like where, where did that information come from? And that's why I hate those study guides. You give me a yeah. study guide that has the regulations written right next to it. The AIM, the source. Sure. I I'm happy with that. But well, I guess, okay. It does say, this one does say AC 0045. So I guess if I want to go dive into advisory circulars, which, you know, there are some great ones. I, mm. I do. But still, I don't know. Um, I haven't been able to retain a lot of information that I read in this book. No, and that's that's why I don't really like them. Um, again, stories. That's what your brain's really hardwired to listen to. Um, yeah. So, uh, you got any other questions? No. No? I don't think so. All right. My brain is full. <laughs> and no. Just keep that in mind when you are going through your check ride and you get to this point where a lot of check, a lot of questions have been asked. You can start to feel mm -hmm. a little brain fog setting in. Uh huh. Tell your DPE it's time for a break. Oh, wow. I can do that. Okay. Yeah. Tell okay. them you got to go to the bathroom. Tell them you want to yeah. go get a cookie, right? Uh, it's uh -huh. your check ride to fail, not their check ride to fail. Okay. Okay. Um, so just keep that in mind. You set the pace. And if you lose situational awareness on your IFR check ride, admit it, ask for a hold. Okay. All right. I lost my situational awareness on my multi-engine IFR check ride. And I just straight up said, I like, I was, when I did my multi-engine IFR check ride, I did it in a completely different avionics package than what I learned my IFR in. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So I'm, I'm trying to like set up the missed approach and I completely get off course and lose my situational awareness. And I'm just like, Hey, ATC, I'm not sure where I'm at. Can you give me a hold, direct me to a fix so I can hold where I'm safe so I can reorient myself? Yeah. I still passed. Sweet. Okay. okay. Good to know. Losing situational awareness is not a, is, is not a failure. Losing situational awareness and not recognizing it or not willing to admit it is a point of failure. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah. Good luck. And as I said, you know, at the end of almost every single one of these, this little discord that we're doing these in, um, there's like 300 other students in here. There's like three other instructors in here as well. Um, so okay. if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. There's other people here trying to do the same thing you're doing. All I right. 
This is awesome. Okay. Well, I appreciate you so much. Yeah, of course. You enjoy the rest of your night. You too. Have a good one. Oh, shit. That's still recording. <laughs>